I know. I think right. I think we're right. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to stop this recording for now, and then I will click it again uh, whenever we get started, and I will be happy to kick us off, and then I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Sounds good. Okay, great. Talk soon. Hi everyone, welcome to iNACL's March Teacher Talk webinar. So grateful you all could join us this evening. I will go ahead and get started as a few more folks continue to trickle in here. My name is Natalie Abel, I'm a program manager here at iNACL, and I would like to welcome you to our Teacher Talk webinar on an introduction to maker education and maker spaces for teachers and education leaders. So before we get started today, I have just a few housekeeping items to go over with you. In the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a chat box. I encourage you to introduce yourself. We'd love to know who you are, where you're tuning in from. Um, if you're a teacher and you're exploring maker education or you're just getting started, you know, we'd love to know at what level um, you, you know about maker education. And we'd love to know what schools you're from and where you're from all around the country as well. And with that in mind, please be sure to ask any questions you have in the chat box as well. And we'll be sure to save some time at the very end during Q&A and get those questions answered for you. So don't be shy. And we also encourage you to share what you're learning on social media. So. Yep, Ashley just shared some information with you in the chat box, so be sure to uh, share what you're learning with your networks there as well and extend the conversation. And lastly, today's webinar will be recorded and archived, so we will send you a follow-up email after tonight's webinar, which will include the link to access this full webinar recording as well as download the slides. So you'll be able to refer back to this at any time in the future or share it with your colleagues and networks as well. So with that, uh, I'd like to quickly introduce our presenters this evening. Uh, we have Mary Esselman of Operation Breakthrough. And with her are two teachers. We have Kathy Ramirez, who is a lead teacher at St. Vincent's Operation Breakthrough. And we have Jadwin Rolls, who is a Smart Lab Education Coordinator at Operation Breakthrough. So with that, I promise not to take up too much more of your time. Um, and I will now turn it over to you, Mary, to get us started today. Great. Well, hello, everyone. We're really excited to share some of the work that we're doing today as well as learn what others are doing so everyone um, in the group can benefit. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about we've actually been making um, for about a year and a half. We opened our maker space back in the summer of 2016, uh, 2015. And we also opened our smart lab, which in, incorporates STEM and digital media arts uh, this past summer. So we've got lots going on. We wanted to give you some pictures right off the bat of just some of the projects that our kids have been working on. But I'm going to just give you a little bit of background in terms of um, what we're doing and the premises behind what we're doing. And then I'm going to turn it over to Jad and Kathy, who are going to actually take you through four um, projects or what we call launchers that have started just a stream of, of different works in our makerspace. Uh, so I'm going to just jump right in. When we started and decided we were going to enter into making, we started with the day of inspiration. And so we took a team of teachers. And these are just pictures that teachers collected on that day. We're from Kansas City. And so we actually took our teachers down to St. Louis. And we spent a day just investigating, exploring, just getting excited and inspired. So we required each teacher to do a Pinterest board. And then we visited the Magic House, we visited Tech Shop, we visited the Science Center, just to generate ideas on what we could incorporate in the space that we were getting ready to design. So as I move forward, I'm going to go ahead and have you all use your little poll button 
is right up at the top of the main room where it lists all this. There's a little checkbox. And if you could just take a quick poll and let us know, one, if you are already um, have a makerspace, um, just give us a big yes there so we can get a sense of where we are in terms of the group. So I'll kind of let those filter in and I'm going to just kind of keep moving through. Um, so one of the reasons that we wanted to incorporate um, the makerspace is we spend a lot of time working on self-regulation and we really wanted to shift as kids became more self-regulated. We wanted them to be able to move to becoming more self-directed with an internal locus of control. We serve about 420 kids from the urban core in Kansas City from birth through 13. So our birth to fives are about 300 are here every day, all day. And so we start our maker um, education for, with two-year-olds and it goes all the way up to 13-year-olds. In fact, today in our maker space, we have the um, top award chef uh, from Kansas City who just won a competition who is um, uh, doing some exercises with uh, some of our school age kids. And then we have 120 for school age. We'll actually be opening a bigger maker space next year. We're going to be opening an 18,000 square foot maker village, which will expand on some of the stuff that you're seeing today. So three things really are behind what we've been doing. One is just an opportunity for our kids to be more innovative, be more creative. We wanted them to be able to tinker, problem solve, and just really use a lot of different digital and hands-on tools. There was a great study done by the Jet Propulsion Lab in which they were finding that they were hiring these engineers from absolute top schools in the country. And what they were finding is they weren't able to solve a lot of the problems they were being faced with. And so when they started interviewing some of their engineers who retired, one of the things they found is those that tinkered when they were young, that took things apart, put them back together, were those that had the strongest problem solving skills. And that's really the impetus behind everything that we do. Um, kind of a couple of things that as you look at the projects we do, this will just give you the background of how we individualize the learning. In our makerspace, you're going to see a lot of launchers and we're actually going to give you access um, to a learning management system that has a lot of the launchers we use if, if you would like those to help you get started. But we basically allow for scaffolding with those. We have launchers that range um, from preschoolers to middle schoolers that use them, just the sophistication with which they attack them different. And some of those are basic self-directed. Um, others give some direction because we're trying to build some basic skills. Um, kids are allowed to work at their own pace. They actually make choices. So even as young as three, year old, three years old, our kids are actually choosing which zone they work in. Kathy's going to start in a minute and show you kind of how our zones are organized. But all of the things that we do, we align back to common core standards and early learning standards. So Kathy, why don't you go ahead and kind of show them a little bit about how our space works. So this is our maker space and what we have in our maker space are six zones and what you're looking at in the first picture is kind of an overview of our space and what you're looking into are the two big orange tables. The first one is where we do a lot of our construction projects and this is our construction zone where we're able to build things. Um, the second table is our studio arts table and that is where a lot of our art projects go on. Um, the big carpet area is for a large construction project. Uh, there's a big bench right here in the second picture that you can see. There's a lot of construction materials that are not available in their classrooms that are um, just special items that they're able to explore. There's a lot of open-ended um, construction materials they're able to pull out and just they're able to build with and construct with. Um, right behind that table, there's the bench, there is a big table that has a, there's two sewing machines and those are our, that's our textile zone. I have school agers right now who are working on some sewing projects. <coughs> In the third picture, you can see that we have part of our studio art um, in jars and we have a paper sorter. Everything is all sorted out for the kids to go through. Um, that's just part of my background, how things are sorted out just because um, I really firmly believe that children need to have everything kind of sorted for them and so they're not, you know, it's not chaotic and it's very 
open and it's very um, clear for them to see what they need. Um, in the fourth picture, you can see our construction and toy hacking zone where they're able to hack into all kinds of electronics. Um, I give them lots of open-ended prompts where they're able to go into DVD players and DVR players and stereos and um, try to find the speakers and the circuit boards and they have access to all real tools and they are able to go in and, and just take things apart and try to put them back together again. Um, one of our zones that is not pictured here is our coding zone. Um, all of our three, four, and five-year-olds are introduced to coding through several different apps. And by the time they go into kindergarten, most of our children are proficient in basic coding. And we also have a green screen where they are able to do their documentation. And we also have in the back, in the first picture, you can kind of see in the back there is a kitchen where the children are, they learn how to cook every day in our, in our kitchen, in our kitchen zone. So my name is Jed Rolls. I'm the uh, Smart Lab Coordinator uh, here at Operation Breakthrough. Um, as you can tell, at the top uh, left-hand side uh, is kind of the basic layout of our Smart Lab. Um, you can see the kids interacting uh, with each other and working on different projects. Um, and then you see the goofy guy in the middle walking around. But um, what basically how our lab is made up, it's, um, it's, it's made up of four different zones. Um, each zone, uh, is, it, our lab is a turnkey uh, system. And each each um, zone has different different uh, programs that we use. Um, so basically, what happens is, is they will start out in their first zone, and let's say they're working on a basic uh, uh, pre web design program. Um, once the, they'll go through the learning launcher in that uh, web design program, and then they will go through and once they've mastered it, they will move on to the next zone. So really, um, each zone they they spend probably anywhere between 7 to 14 days um, on one project. And then once they've mastered that project, they can move on to another one. And the, the whole goal of, of this uh, program is to get them to master every, every, every uh, program and uh, 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 manipulative that we have in the classroom. And then they'll be able to be innovative and move on and, and create their own uh, projects um, from their own imagination. Um, our programs. Uh, cover anywhere between pre-graphic design, uh, pre-animation, um, circuitry, robotics, uh, different different aspects um, of, of 21st century skills that we want to impart towards our kids. On the bottom left-hand side, you can you can see uh, two girls playing with a ball and, and stick joint uh, a manipulative. That is called a zone tool, and that particular um, activity they were working on building a bridge that uh, through a, a STEM literacy activity uh, called uh, uh, through uh, for three billion for up. And they the goal of that activity was to build a bridge and to build a design that held the weight of a five pound uh, troll, which is actually a robot that we had in our classroom. So that was after reading the story. And then on the right hand side, you can see we have uh, several uh, storage units of all of our activities. We have connects, we have snap circuits, uh, we've got Vernier uh, science experiment equipment that interface with uh, programs on our computer. And we have uh, uh, Makey Makey, which is a circuit board that um, shows that is another circuitry uh, unit that you can connect different alligator cords to and turn different uh, conductive materials into basically a, a, a keyboard. So you can turn fruit into, uh, into a piano that interfaces with a, a program on Scratch. I think one of the things that um, has been really powerful for us is the connection between the two spaces. Down in the maker space, kids are really using a lot of recyclables. They're um, having opportunities to really create based on those launchers. So, for example, um, a self-directed launcher might be something in the wind tunnel, such as how do you make a straw fly or how do you build a parachute that stays inside the tunnel. So kids start to learn early those principles of drag and lift. So our maker space is divided into several zones. One of the first zones is circuits and robotics. We have several different kinds of snap circuit sets that the children are allowed to go and get out with their teacher and go through different projects. 
Um, we also have coding and programming. Again, the children are learning the basics of coding so that whenever they get to kindergarten, they're ready to come up to the smart lab with Jad and begin on like scratch and start writing their own programs. Uh, we have studio arts where they are, um, I was an art teacher for 10 years and so in the studio arts, it's more about learning um, art techniques and learning how to use paints correctly and how to do um, open-ended art projects. Um, in our construction and toy hacking, we have all kinds of things that we've been doing. We've built our own conveyor belt systems. We've gone in and we have Lego challenges where they have to construct a little city where they have to design their own. Right now we're working on our own kind of um, a, a neighborhood with boxes. They're doing all kinds of toy hacking projects um, and textiles. They're going to be incorporating textiles into their, um, their neighborhoods next week. Um, in cooking, they have done everything from making homemade applesauce to making their own kind of um, salsa to baking bread to um, making their own, own um, apple pie from the crust all the way up to learning how to make homemade apple pie filling. Um, everything is about learning where their food comes from and we have an outdoor classroom where they grow their own food. And so it's bringing it back into the, um, into the maker space and learning how to cook it. Um, our fabrication and design, we have a 3D printer where we have um, programs where they're able to design things and then print them out. And our organic mechanics is about life sciences and um, experimentation with the life sciences. So before we jump into the actual um, projects that they've been working on over the last couple of months, I just want to open it up to the group to find out, do you have any questions in terms of how we started the process in terms of designing the spaces or in terms of any of the zones you've seen? We can go ahead and address those before we move forward into some of the projects that we're going to talk about today. All right, well, while you're thinking about those, oh, Go ahead, I think someone's trying to talk. No? All right, we'll just keep going then. We picked four projects that we thought would be useful in terms of looking at the array of activities that you can do, whether you have a standalone lab or whether you've got a maker cart system that can be very powerful in terms of initiating making in your classroom. So let's go ahead and start with building cities and circuits. First off, it's okay. I have a survey question I'd like to ask. Sure. Okay. Yeah. sure. Um, so I was curious, anybody online right now, who is thinking or actually has started a makerspace program at their school or, or a classroom or is thinking about it? Anyway, I'll go ahead and answer that while you guys are. I think two of you have already answered that question, but if the others want to chime in. So do you do everything at once or one zone at a time? So basically what happens is kids come in and they, um, depending on their age, the youngest ones actually sit on the rug first, and then they find out which zones are open and they actually choose. So they have 90 minute blocks in the maker space and they are able to actually choose which zone they're going to go to. I would say early on kids tend to rotate a couple of times during the 90 minutes, but kids that are really engaged in some things will spend the entire 90 minutes on a project and then return to it in subsequent classes. Do we have any other questions? Okay, then we'll go on to building cities and circuits. Um, so we began we began in the maker in the makerspace and STEM lab with reading Iggy Peck Architect. Um, the goal the goal of uh, STEM literacy is choosing a book that has themes related related to uh, the STEAM uh, acronym science, technology, engineering, arts, and math mathematics. Um, so that is that's that's the goal where you should first start off when you're choosing a book. Um, and you should also you should also be thinking of like creative ideas of projects that you can pull from that book as well. Um, the class that story shows obviously was uh, Iggy Peck Architect. So after reading that story um, in the makerspace, uh, we had decided to do an activity uh, of building a recyclable city. 
Um, we chose building a city from recyclable materials to relate to, that relate to the story. This involves multiple academic disciplines uh, using geometric shapes, math and spatial reasoning, measurement, patterning, inquiry through observation and investigation, and using visual arts as well. Um, with that too, in the uh, Smart Lab, we chose to uh, build a, a cityscape of our, uh, as, as our activity. So with the cityscape, we combine two different things. We, com we combine uh, building circuits and uh, also being creative and looking, looking at cityscapes. Um, for instance, so with circuits, like our students learned uh, the basic parts of a closed circuit using a uh, LED light bulb. Um, copper tape and a lithium battery, uh, and we just we went through the understanding of how electricity works. And we started with pre-K up through uh, kindergarten and first grade, so our kids have a very, very good understanding of where electricity comes from, what produces electricity, uh, not just from a battery but also in their community from a, a power plant. Um, and then we went on from there to from creating our, our circuits, as you can tell in the uh, pictures, to uh, creating our uh, city state as well. Okay, as you can tell, um, our kids got really creative. Uh, we gave them pictures of different uh, Kansas City nighttime skylines uh, that they could look at. And so what we did first is we had them draw their, their actual project on three different three sections uh, of a trifold uh, cardboard uh, science fair uh, uh, project uh, trifold. And what we did is we had them draw their picture of their skyline, and we, we had them use pictures for, for inspiration, and then we had them build their circuits on the back where they wanted to display their light. Uh, so as you can tell, it was a very fun and creative project for our kids. Our kids stayed, in, stayed engaged, and this particular project was uh, for kindergarten and first graders. Uh, we had a blast doing it. You know, a couple of other projects some of the older kids did is after they learned about circuits, um, we had one student who decided to just start designing a prosthetic using what he learned through circuits. We had another student who designed a large ornament that was um, used copper wire to um, produce lighting. And another student that used tin foil and circuits to create a dance gym um, gaming system. And then even um, from the movie Big, our youngest students actually created paper pianos and then hooked in the circuits and um, used it to actually play music by stepping on the key. So we've been able to do all kinds of additional activities just based on that initial simple idea of teaching kids about circuits and then allowing them to progress based on different things they had read or different video snippets or other things that um, they talked about. And it gave them that freedom once they had learned the fundamentals, you know, to have two, three, or four weeks even to just become um, more engaged and develop their own ideas. I saw that question that someone had asked about, you know, how did we design the spaces? So we did that day of inspiration. Um, and then when we came back and kind of collected all of the Pinterest boards and the ideas, we then drew out the space and did some space planning. And then on the course that we're going to give you access to, we have the one pager that we use to fund it. So we, we took that to IKEA. IKEA provided all of our furniture. We have two or three um, item lists that we cir circulate among businesses and some of our different aligned groups. And so most of what you see on those shelves that Kathy was pointing out are all donations. So pretty much the space, other than the construction for us, because we actually took down old walls to make a bigger space, are all donated items. So hopefully Mario, that section of our website, Mario, will, or the, the um, course, will be helpful to you if you're trying to figure out how am I going to fund this, you know, how to move forward on that. So after we read this story, Iggy Peck Architect, we kind of went in a different um, direction. And we kind of went into the 3D art um, medium, and we did a box city. So each classroom, in, at Operation Breakthrough, we have um, five different neighborhoods. And each neighborhood has, um, 
each one has a five-year-old classroom and then a four-year-old classroom. And so each classroom got to design their own um, box city. And so I, like Mary said, we have, I get donations a lot. What I did was I put out a wish list, and we have a wonderful committee called the Grapevine. And so everybody took a wish list back to their, their own neighborhoods, and then they all copied it, and we've been getting lots of donations. And so I save these donations up, and this is what happens. And I give these children tons and tons of tinkering materials, and they got to talk to each other and negotiate and collaborate, and they design their own cities. And so the first step was to go through and plan out their cities, and some of them put bridges, some of them put high rises, some of them put lots of buildings, and they put all kinds of detail into them. And they had the best time of just designing the city. And so the next step was they got to get the paint out. And so in the next slide, you'll see, um, if you want to see it, you'll see that they got to decorate. And so after they, they had a whole week of painting and we got lots of textiles out, um, all kinds of fabric and ribbons and they they have the best time. And one thing about our maker space and the population we serve is we have a lot of children who have um, they have a hard time with their self control and they have a wonderful time in the maker space. And I do not have the problems of behavior issues. And this kind of activity captivated them and they were so passionate about these cities because they were their own creations and they they loved them. And so they they were so proud of their work. We displayed their cities up in the front lobby of our school for and it was over a month because they would show everybody who walked in the building their Whole box cities, and every classroom got to name their city, and we had it and like, elevated it in different different locations. And one of our students actually made this giant spaceship to guard over the cities, and um, it was a fantastic way of um, just showcasing the artwork and the hard work and dedication. I mean, the perseverance of these students was amazing. So. It was, it was a really great experience for them. I think what was interesting is when you look at this, um, the cities they did with the actual recyclables, now kids are going through the process of using Legos and other tools, um, using software to do some design work, and then using those to build larger cities. So we're seeing whether you're working with four or five-year-olds or you're working with 12 and 13-year-olds, you can see applications across the grade levels um, from just emerging from one simple story. These are the launchers um, that we use across the board. And these are in the course if you'd like access at the end. The launchers really have, um, not only do they show a prompt and the materials that are needed, but they also have different standards that they're aligned to. So you can see across the curriculum. They also have visual prompts. Our goal long term is to actually create audio prompts as well so that it continues to individualize for students so that they can go off in directions that they're interested in as opposed to just doing those that might happen to be out at any given time. So let's go into the power of the wind. So yeah, the power of the wind. Um, in the makerspace, the children are given the opportunity to hack into uh, different fans and, and in the early childhood stage. And they were able to tinker and look at what makes a fan work and look at the power of wind. Um, next you can see here, uh, this is a, a, a student that we had, uh, the, as, as Mary was mentioning before, uh, our Lego We Do uh, education program. And as you can tell, he's building a, or maybe you can't, uh, he's building a, an airplane that uh, requires the use of, of a propeller. So this is a great uh, example of how we incorporate design and coding, uh, pre-coding skills uh, with our students. This in particular child, this particular child is five years old, and what he's building is an airplane, and uh, the program itself gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to build the design, but he actually didn't uh, follow every step. He modified and uh, used his own creativity to build his own propeller at the top a little bit longer, actually, and put a man uh, flying around on the actual propeller itself. Uh, the neat thing is, 
uh, you know, he used his own creativity and was able to, to code and make it work. So and he's been one of the few actual uh, preschool kids who've actually been able to be successful in creating that design and actually making it work. And as we go to the next slide, uh, we have the story. We have, again, we have a, uh, in the Smart Lab, we chose the story, uh, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And again, this is just the next step uh, in choosing a, a STEM literacy book for third graders to uh, teach them how to use the power of wind and, and, and to use their own design. The story in itself actually is about a boy in a small village who uh, realizes that his, his, his village has no way of producing water, producing uh, energy or anything like that. So he uses, he uses his own uh, ingenuity and creativity uh, to read books and, and learn how to, to create his own uh, windmill and turbine to uh, create power for his community. And if you look over on the right, um, our, our kids uh, we create. We had our kids create uh, the same type of uh, uh, project with Lego. We do in creating a Ferris wheel with the, the fan uh, shape. They were able to create that model and then use the coding to uh, to program and make the actual uh, uh, windmill move. And here you can see we have a our, we have our launcher that we use uh, for our kiddos um, in, in our in probably third through fifth grade. Um, at the beginning, you see the first box that gives the materials that's listed for recyclables that they'll use to make their own wind turbine. And then as we go on uh, uh, to the next uh, arrow, we get to the next uh, box that gives you, it gives them the prediction um, on the very top right-hand side there, it gives them the prediction, and the prediction is how many washers can your wind turbine pull. So the, the goal was for them to build their own wind turbine and, and to find out which wind turbine actually holds the most watchers that's being, being held by a string by the fan. And then they get an example uh, down at the bottom right hand corner and then they are given a challenge at the end that says, can you change the shape of your blades, of your blades to catch more wind? And so that, that's interesting because, you know, the kids are challenged to create and find a, a different shape or a different way that they could turn their, their blade that would catch more wind and in turn carry more weight for their wind turbine. And again, as you can see at the top left hand side and, and bottom right, you see a continuation of our, our kiddos using the Lego Weedy program to build their own uh, windmill design and, and uh, wind blades uh, through the, through the uh, actual step by step process and then learn how to code it. Um, to teach it, to teach the uh, design how to move on the program. So one of our favorite um, activities in our in the maker space is exploration of our wind tunnel. And so we have three, four, and five year olds understanding the principles of lift and grab. And the way they have, that we've accomplished this is that I've given them so many different kinds of prompts that. Um, allow them to build different kinds of models and then test them inside the wind tunnel. And they are able to see in real time how lift is created in the wind tunnel and how drag is created whenever we add too much weight to something and how we capture the wind. And it is the most creative process because they're allowed to go back and experiment and try and try again. Um, and they're also, um, they, they're just given these challenges. And my older students who are from school age, they, they are given some um, harder challenges where they have to see if they can create drag by adding more weight to their projects to see if they can add enough weight before it um, is not able to create lift. And my younger students, my two-year-olds, they, they're, they're able to create things that are just able to fly through the wind tunnel. And so the wind tunnel is really a, a, a master educator when it comes to Bernoulli's principles of flight. And so these kids, I mean, they just absolutely, if you can see their faces, I mean, they just absolutely love watching things fly. And so it's a, it's a great problem solving tool, but it's also a wonderful way of just educating children about the principles of flight. And one of the things that was really neat when you did some of the weighted projects where kids were having to create 
different hypotheses in terms of how many blocks it would take. They then have cameras and iPads and phones that they're allowed to take pictures while they're working, which is where our green screen comes into play because they're actually then able to talk about their projects. In particular, the two things we're trying to add to their portfolios this year is one where they talk about a project or a problem that they solve in an area that they're super passionate about. And the other is to really just walk through a problem they had and then what they had to do to actually solve it. And so those are their two portfolio entries that they will have this year. Again, here's a couple of launchers. We just stuck these in so that you could actually um, take a look at these after the session because you'll have access to um, the PowerPoint. And these those oh, launchers also that. have, um, these are ones that I've tied into Common Core standards. So you can also see how these are very applicable to the Common Core um, system. One of the things that we found is we get a lot of volunteers, more so in the makerspace and the smart lab than even sometimes the classrooms. And so on the back of these launchers is, um, are, are all of the standards that are noted, but they're kind of translated for volunteers. So that when a volunteer comes in, they actually know what's the end game of having kids build something or offering a certain prompt. Pat, please call 126. Pat, call 126. In, I didn't answer that question. I saw a question that asked about how we balance makerspace time and uh, science time. Uh, how we do that is we, we, with each classroom, we have scheduled throughout their day or throughout the week to come in one time a week uh, to the makerspace and the STEM lab uh, to spend uh, 90 minutes in the uh, makerspace itself and then an hour in our STEM lab. So we actually go through and we work around the teacher schedule um, to make that happen for all of our students. And then we have a before and after school program um, that in which we partner with other schools around the uh, city in which we have uh, other students come in and actually uh, uh, use our, our makerspace and smart lab as well about two hours uh, uh, every day. One of the things that's kind of interesting is we're participating in this Malaysian exchange project. Right now where um, some of our upper elementary and middle school students are actually exchanging videos every two weeks with a classroom in Malaysia. And so we just finished our first Lego League competition and some of the boys created a video and as one of the boys was describing some of the work that they do in the lab, he said, you know, it's kind of like school but it's harder, and uh, which I thought was really interesting. And then he ended up by saying, and it's really great even for kids who don't like school. And I think if, if there's anything that I can stress enough in terms of what we found over the last 18 months is that even our kids that seem the most dysregulated or have um, challenging behaviors in regular classrooms are able to come in and actually persist for 90 minutes without even blinking. And we see that with five-year-olds and we see it with 12-year-olds. Um, there's something about the opportunity to really explore and tinker and, and just create um, without the confines of do it this way that just brings out the best in some of our kids who don't thrive in a traditional classroom. All right, let's go into um, bread baking. So our kitchen zone is one of our favorite zones to be in. And this past winter, our children went through an entire um, bread baking um, course. And so they learned how we use yeast to bake bread. And so they got to go through the whole process of learning how yeast is, we activate yeast, and they started with bread in a bag, and then they eventually moved on to learning how to make their own bread. And so what you see in these pictures is the children are involved in every single step. They measure their own flour, they measure their own yeast, um, they get to activate it by adding their sugar and their warm water, and they knead their bread, and so we ended up baking all kinds of bread, and they they loved it, and so they knew that they had to add their warm water because the yeast would have to come alive, and they they could tell everybody about how to make their bread. And so we we evolved that into baking different kinds of bread. And in the last picture, you can see one of our little girls painting an egg wash on some challah bread, and they learned how to turn a, a bread recipe into like pizza crust and all kinds of different things. And so. 
they were, I mean, they were calling themselves bakers. They were very passionate about it. They they would come in right away and sit down, and because they knew they had to let their yeast um, activate for at least 15 minutes, and um, they they were pretty ex- pretty much experts by the time they were finished, and so they knew the smell of the yeast. If I had it already um, started activating before they would come in, they they were they were very much experts. So they love they love this activity, and so that's one thing that they always they're always asking is when when are we gonna bake bread again? And this is one of the recipes uh, for the rustic French bread that they made, and they they were so proud of themselves. They they were bakers, and so they they did they baked the bread. Well, I think one of the things that was nice about this project is there's truly a gradual release of responsibility, because in the early stages, kids were really uncomfortable with all of the different um, processes. Because you know when you each get the opportunity to work with dough. Um, you know, at first it can be a little bit intimidating, but by the end, I mean, they were really working at start to finish. Um, and that held true for kids that were 3, 4, and 5, as well as kids that were 10, 11, and 12. And so um, we have actually kids that are 10, 11, 12 that can do great bread by themselves. Now they can do pizza by themselves, and they understand the idea of um, if it doesn't have the consistency, what you have to do to change it. So I think. That's probably where, you know, I don't know if you often see a kitchen in a maker space, but I think for us, that's been very transformative for kids because it also has allowed them to really see how things change form. Um, you know, from, I think one of the biggest shocks was the applesauce project, and they were using the crank mills and everything, but this idea that the apple, that's what it turned into, and the same thing where you could just take this bowl of water and then add flour, and then the idea of tasting sweet versus savory. So there are just so many explorations that have come out of those projects. In our new maker village that I was mentioning earlier, where we're going to have kind of 18,000 square feet, you know, our kitchen is, is going to change from just having kind of the counter, which has really worked well, to really having stations where kids can be very independent. We had the opportunity to work with some high school kids, and we can share this. Um, as well, if anyone's interesting, but last, um, I guess it's been two weeks, it was called a design challenge, and we had kids from a suburban high school that were in a CAPS program that was very much STEM, hands-on um, program with, with kids from one of our urban high schools who were in a creative writing, and they spent a day at the local art institute doing a learning challenge to really express what an experience is like um, for a high school student in a maker space. And they did a call to action. They actually wrote a story from a character they developed and they were fascinated. And then they did a 3D representation of what they thought a maker space should actually look like, feel like, um, how it should actually function from the perspective of what kinds of materials, what kind of furniture, um, um, what what would make it feel um, engaging. And the kids who had, one of the things they were most excited about was the fact that kids could try things that they thought they were interested in and kind of learn whether they were or not before they actually went on to school. And I thought that was one of the really powerful sentiments that we heard. So this is just a collage of some of the other kinds of things we do in the makerspace. Um, I have all kinds of different projects and different um, prompts for them to do. Like we've done, um, they've built their own boats. They, they get to do all kinds of construction. We have snap circuits um, in the center. You can see them making their, um, their pizza crust. Uh, we do all kinds. You can see in the corner over here, we have um, this is a group of three-year-olds who are coding. Um, at the bottom, there is a picture of a, a wooden tinker box they put out that is all kinds of wooden tinker parts, and um, they build all kinds of things with just like pork and little pieces of wood and, and clothes tins and um, toilet paper tubes, and it just it, it allows for creative freedom. And one thing with tinkering and building is like you have to give them some creative freedom, and that really helps grow that brain. And, 
Um, down here, the little girl who's smiling, that, that, that's actually her little house that she built one day. And she took her, I mean, it took her a whole 90 minutes, but it's a little shoebox, and she just went and collected little items off the shelves, and um, she had a whole story that she would tell everybody in the hallway about her little house. And so um, that's just something that, you know, they become very passionate, and they really are proud of themselves, and it really does boost their self-esteem, and they, it just makes them very proud of what they, 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 they create. And so these are just some images from um, our makerspace. I think that's a, the one of the reasons they sometimes get questions as to why do you have coding in a makerspace when it's really mainly about hands-on building, taking things apart. And one of the reasons we do that is because we really want coding and programming to become a habit of mind so that it doesn't become a discrete kind of learning experience, but rather just part of the way kids think, um, the way that they process, and that's why that connection is so important. One of the things that is important is they learn some of those functional aspects when they're in the makerspace, but then when they come upstairs into the smart lab where there's much more of a digital media, presence, they're actually able to apply it in things that they're building and then have the ability to program. We actually had our first two um, robotics teams this year, and we have a five to seven year old team, and then we have an eight to 12 year old team. And um, that's just, this is kind of, I think, cultivated and a whole attitude of thinking that we're seeing that has really helped kids in something that they've had kind of zero experience before this year. So I think at this point we're ready to open up and just kind of have some dialogue because I know a couple of you indicated that you actually um, either are starting on a makerspace or you have a makerspace. So to the extent that we could just have some conversation and also and answer other questions about um, some of the launchers that we do or how we've designed the space, that would be great. Great. Thank you guys so much. That was such a wonderful Thank overview. Um, let's please open it up for questions now. Feel free to throw them in the chat box. We did have one a little bit earlier around assessing mastery and how you do that in collaborative and cooperative creative projects. So I didn't know if you wanted to touch on that one a little bit more. That's a that's a yeah, I can touch on that a little bit. That is something we've started this year. We talked about the green screen because we're trying to focus on the fact that learning is the assessment. Um, and so having kids help participate in the documentation and then and then really that whole communication piece of can I actually articulate what it is I'm doing, where I had some stumbling blocks and, and how I was able to solve those. So that's been our primary um, medium for doing that. And then we have set out to begin to use the engaged standards, which really look at technical proficiency. They look at communication and collaboration um, and creativity as, as a means for us to begin developing a rating scale for things. So that's kind of how we're attacking the mastery piece. The smart lab system actually has, um, because it was a turnkey, it has a a journaling feature for kids, and then it has assessment rubrics where kids assess one another in the projects in terms of their participation, um, the extent to which they were able to successfully reach their goal. So we have kind of that informal piece that are kids that are doing with one another, and then those um, more external pieces that we're looking for so we can see if kids are actually able to articulate, you know, what it is they're doing. In terms of our administrative support, we're pretty lean and mean. So you basically have Kathy facilitating in the makerspace and Jad in the smart lab. The teachers actually, and this is, I, I should point this out, this is kind of a tough one because um, we've had cases where when teachers come into the labs, um, you know, it, it, in the beginning it was kind of just kind of letting them go and thinking it was, now it was Jad and Kathy's time, and we really want Jad and Kathy to be more facilitated. And so we're continuing to put out frames 
for the launchers earlier and earlier so that teachers can really link them to other things that are going on in their classrooms so that it doesn't feel like, oh, I do this in my classroom and then I do this in the makerspace, but they can be more exploratory and extensions of some of the things they're doing. So we're trying to get more and more teachers engaged. It's a very different kind of teaching. Many of our teachers are very uncomfortable because they're not, you know, at first they're not sure if I, I get to just do it alongside of the kids or, and then we don't want them doing it for the kids. And so um, it takes a little time to get some comfort. We actually had our teachers spend time in the lab for their own professional development. So having them go through the launchers and things. We have the lab open in the afternoons for teachers if they wish to come in. We have not had a big um, uptake on that, you know, for when teachers are in planning or on break. So that's kind of how our administrative support looks like. But Kathy and Jad really do the frames, um, uh, the frames of kind of what launchers are coming when, and then teachers can modify or adapt those um, should they choose. That's super interesting, and that's something that we hear over and over again is, you know, whenever you're implementing these new designs, it really changes the instructional models that teachers use, and it, it certainly requires buy-in, and it certainly requires support um, from all directions. So um, thank you very much for explaining that a little bit further. And Vicki just... Um, popped a question there in the chat box. She asked, have your report cards changed to reflect the new approach to learning? You mentioned some of those 21st century skills and some changes and things like persistence and communication and problem solving. Do you, do you have any metrics there or um, reflections on report cards that reflect those ideas? Since we do not do a traditional report card system here, that would be a no. I can speak to my experience prior to this when we were using a very similar personalized, um, we were in a student-centered kind of personalized model in which kind of what was anytime, any place, anywhere learning. And there we were adapting the report cards to include more of those skills as part of on the grading system, there we actually have a graduation by defense, which really captured these where kids actually had to, as part of their transition years from elementary to middle, middle to high, we were working on those um, as I came to Operation Breakthrough, and then as seniors. And so they not only had to speak to challenges that they'd overcome and strengths they were bringing, um, you know, as they left school, but then they had to take one of these types of projects and talk through the project and um, what they encountered, how they designed it, um, the challenges that they faced, and then how they problem solved through those, how they troubleshooted. And then they had to pose for a 20-minute question and answer session. And then all of that was scored on a rubric. That's so interesting. Thank you. So I haven't seen any. So any other I questions? I haven't seen any more questions pop in the chat box. Um, I did have one of my own questions for you, though. And you mentioned the launchers earlier, and I think you'll go back to that a little bit here at the end. Um, and they're a great way to get started. But I wanted to know if you have any advice or tips for a teacher who might just be getting started in maker education or any specific resources that you would recommend that teachers turn to? Well, I'll start in a bit. Why don't we each respond to that one? But I think the day of inspiration, whether you're doing it with others or you're doing it by yourself, is absolutely critical. Um, I think that you need to go out there and kind of see what the world looks like in terms of different kinds of opportunities because it just gets you starting. And then having that Pinterest board where you capture your ideas I think was critical for when we took our group, half the group had never done a Pinterest board. And then when they started pinning things and their brains got working, it became very easy not only to envision what our space could become, but then it just started a flood of ideas 
for what those launchers would look like. And, and if you see our early ones from 18 months ago, like originally we thought we were going to have these themes once a month, and then we would have this whole array of projects in the theme. That we probably have not, um, we, we don't necessarily work that way. Now it's really more about tapping into interest and a little bit more flow. So we were trying to plan a whole year in advance. Now we don't plan more than a month. And so I think that piece is really fun. I think if you're a teacher out there and you want to do it by yourself, see if you can find one other teacher, though, that might be willing to do it with you, because then you have that ability to bounce back and forth. There's so many maker sites out there, and there are plenty of um, museum spaces. We're seeing them pop up more in libraries. So I think there's, and, and we have a maker group in Kansas City that's a big active group. So. There's other places that you can go for kind of inspiration and, you know, just places that can keep you motivated. Because it's, it's definitely a lot of work, um, you know, making sure you have the materials and, and, and proactively getting them so you're not buying them. You know, these, these lists, which I think we have posted if we don't, we'll post them. But having those lists and keep pushing those out, we have so many groups that absolutely love bringing stuff in. They're so proud of the big box of buttons and the box of, of toilet paper rolls. And, uh, and we end, to get, end up getting circuits and robots and things that people bought their kids that then their kids stopped using and they donate to us. You know, machines, because think about it, when you let kids get messy with technology, it um, helps them to be more creative problem solvers. I was going to say, um, <clears throat> A big part of it is don't be afraid to get to jump in. Um, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a, a technology guru. You simply uh, want to get messy. But uh, uh, one of my best friends has been Pinterest, like Mary said. Uh, Pinterest, Pinterest, Pinterest gives you tons of ideas um, and STEM ideas and maker ideas uh, that you can uh, share with your kids. And uh, one last thing, um, as Mary said before as well, uh, it's, it, it, we, kind of, we kind of follow the interests of the children. Um, the kids themselves come up with great ideas, and you just all you have to do is piggyback off that. And more than likely, they're going to come up with, with their own uh, creation. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty impactful, and pretty amazing to see what their kids can do um, as they as they're learning and growing, what they've mastered projects, and how their creativity just kind of grows from that. And my suggestion too is on Facebook. There are lots and lots and lots of maker space groups. Um, there's a Maker Ed group that you can join that will give you lots of ideas, but they also are a support group, and they will talk you through anything. They will give you ideas. Um, there's a lot of sharing that goes on, and um, but there are several different sites on Facebook that you can go on to that you, it's just a lot of maker spaces um, all, all around the world, and so it's, a, it's just a really great asset. So. That's what I like to do. Um, I like to talk to other makers that way, <coughs> maker ed, um, education coordinators that way, and we just um, chat and we talk about what we're doing and um, just get different ideas off of each other that way. I think we lost Mr. G, but I was just going to say in integrating into your general classwork, um, I think the books have been huge for us. On the learning management course that you're going to have access to, we have like 20 or 25 books that are great launchers um, into projects. No, oh, that's the easy one. Um, to answer Vicki's question, I just have a, a, a pretty vast background. Um, my mother was a, a, a scientist, and so, and she was also a, a Girl Scout leader growing up, and so she taught me how to cook, and so, and I just have a coding background already, I, I can pick things up, and so I just kind of a, a, a jack of all trades. And so this was, a, I taught art for 10 years, and so this was kind of a perfect fit for me. And so. Um, but if you're not, yeah. you know, if you're not, that would definitely not um, hinder your. Hinder you, because we have, when Kathy's not there and teachers have to facilitate the spaces, we have volunteers who've never coded a day in their life that take over the coding zone. Our kids haven't sewn, but they're out on the computer finding templates for patterns. So don't let that stop you at all if you're not an expert 
across the zone. Um, we actually do have several books that we've gotten, so we'll put that on as well for John Paul um, on that course. So if you email us, you'll notice our email addresses are here. We will give you access to the course where you can kind of go dig around. It's got everything from how we designed it to sample launchers to books, and we'll add the books that are more teacher books, you know, on thoughts about making that we, because we're constantly trying to grow ourselves. Awesome. Well, I think that brings us about to time. Uh, and I haven't seen any other questions pop up. So I would just reiterate, you know, please contact our presenters today. This is such a fantastic opportunity to have access to a lot of the tools and resources you need to get started and bring some of these projects alive in your own classrooms and schools. Um, what an amazing presentation. I, I deeply appreciate uh, Mary, Jad, and Kathy, you guys spending your time and sharing your expertise with us today. It was, it's fascinating what you all are doing for kids. And, and I was really struck by your conversations around how it's changed students on, on these ideas of engagement and persistence and kids who experience behavioral issues and and now they're just so engaged and they're learning that you don't notice those things as much anymore as issues. So um, it, it's just really fascinating. And I just truly thank you for your time and for what you're doing for students. So um, with that, I think we will close tonight's webinar. If you have any final remarks, please feel free to share them in the chat box with us. And be sure to find us all on Twitter and email us if you need anything else in the future. Thank you all very much for attending, and a special thanks to our presenters this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.